My name is Ben Stockton. I'm the Medical Director of Robotics here at Lakeland. I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. It's a very exciting night for us. We've been, um, uh, everybody can hear me okay? We've been, in the, um, uh, we've been in the field of robotics at Lakeland now almost seven years. And um, over the past year, we've had a lot of changes and we wanted to invite you as our community, as our uh, patients and customers, if you will, to come and see what we're doing here. And so uh, we wanted to take some time to do that tonight. Um, so before we dive into Lakeland, I wanted to take just a few minutes and review the history of robotic surgery, uh, at least the most recent history of robotic surgery. The, the birth of robotic surgery as we know it today really started in the late 70s and, and 80s with the Stanford Research Institute and the National Institutes of Health. Just as we began to ask the questions about how robotics changes the auto industry, for example, research started about how could we use robotics to improve the world of surgery. And so this is one of the groups that first really made headway in this front. Then in the late 1980s, uh, the Department of Defense, through their research branch called DARPA, or the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, heard about this project, learned about this project, and in the military they were very interested in performing surgery on the front line. So how could we operate on a wounded soldier with no surgeon present? Maybe we could have a surgical robot on the front line without the surgeon there. And NASA asked the same question for patients in outer space. And both of these agencies gave funding to that Stan Stanford Research Institute to try to make that happen. Then in about 1995, the early 90s, 1995, NASA and that Department of Defense branch, really they realized that it, it really was not going to happen for them the way they had envisioned it, and they wanted to get out of that business, if you will. And ultimately, the Stanford Research Institute sold their research patents to a company called, to a, a private research group that ultimately became Intuitive Surgical which is the company that makes our surgical robot today. That's what's pictured here, Intuitive Surgical. They're based out in the Bay Area of San Francisco as well. Okay, so how does this work? Um, I know there are a couple of robotic patients out there who may have some concepts of how it works. It's, it's actually not too conceptually complicated. Uh, as you can see uh, on the diagram here, the surgeon uh, will sit at what we call the console. That's the man with his head looking down into the viewfinder and he'll be running controls. You can see the, the man's hands are right here, and he'll be working these controllers. The movements he gives those controllers via his hands, like you would play a, a video game, or like I played a video game when I was 10, and my 10-year-old son now plays, those controllers control the actual arms which are present inside the patient. The arms are present inside the patient uh, via this arm system, this tool system here, for which the first assistant is tending to the patient and tending to the robot. There's a little bit of linguistics debate about whether you really want to call this thing a robot or not. Uh, some people say yes, some people say no, some people say no because it really doesn't do any advanced algorithms sort of independently. Your surgeon does all the work, if you will. The robot simply replicates the movements inside your body. It miniaturizes the movements. It makes our work easier in some sense. And you can see here the picture of the penny next to the actual tool that we use. So here's a little tiny grasper that I might place into your body to remove a prostate to hold on to tissue while my other hand, for example, my right hand, would do some little cutting of tissue. And so that's how we do operations inside the body. So the surgeon watches the operation in this viewfinder right here while the first assistant, this nice woman here, looks at the TV screen to see the things that are going on inside the body. Okay, so does everybody have a concept of sort of how that works then? And what does it look like inside the operating room? It looks, this is not our operating room, but our operating room looks basically just like this. I'll sit over here in the dark drinking Diet Coke, for example, and then you'll be here underneath all these drapes with this octopus of a machine connected to you. And then here's the operation that we see happening on the TV screen right here. 
Wow, I think that's a good way to describe it. Okay, so what about robotics at, at Lakeland? So in 2005 or perhaps 2004, Lakeland made a decision that they wanted to get involved in this robotics business. It was about the year 2000 that robotics really began to make headways into the world of everyday medicine. That's when surgeons around the country really started asking questions, can we do this on patients? Does this have to be just research or can this benefit our patients? 2005 is, is roughly when Lakeland made a decision to do that. They went looking for a robot. In a sense, they went looking for me. In June of 2007, I came to Lakeland. And then in August of 2007, we did our first robotic case, a robotic prostate removal. Um, uh, years went by. We did lots of robotic cases uh, uh, in the world of urology, other fields. In May of 2013, we had a arrival of our new robot. Uh, that has further expanded our robotic abilities uh, importantly. So to date, we've done 705 cases, and we've been happy with our headway. I ended up in the hospital having this uh, horrible abdominal pain, and after a few studies, uh, they found out that I had um, um, stone in my gallbladder. I uh, just happened to be in the office uh, for checkup with uh, Dr. Trehune, and uh, he was doing the normal check for men's prostate situation, and he said, oops, uh, something I check here I don't see, think I like too well, we're gonna have to check further. I had had diverticulitis uh, three different times within a two year period, and um, so I was recommended that I have go see a surgeon. And after talking with him, I felt I needed to have surgery to take care of the problem. Dr. Trehune presented all the options to me, uh, radiation and all the different options, but his recommendation was the using the Da Vinci system with Dr. Stockton. It sounded just very attractive just to have one incision instead of three or four, but I was absolutely given the option and um, he told me the pros and cons of um, each one of them, and I decided, along with my family, to go with the Da Vinci option. I had surgery at noon, and by four o'clock the next morning, I was up and able to walk. I got, got to the hospital at eight o'clock, and by 2.30, I was arriving home already. I had um, very little pain with it. I had small incisions. I was up walking the next morning, and I had a very speedy recovery time. Within a week to 10 days, I was back uh, doing my regular work and, and have been ever since. And so it was just not really a time-consuming situation. I drove the fourth day, the fifth day. I did kind of normal stuff around the house, and the sixth day I was already out doing, doing stuff, not at work, but. Um, I went back to work a um, week and a half later with no restrictions. I'm very, very pleased and, and very happy to have been able to stay locally rather than to have had to go to anywhere else, really. And I sure don't want to go to Chicago if I don't have to or things like that. So I really appreciate having the expertise here in St. Joe. I think it's wonderful. I think um, everybody should go for this type of surgery. It's, it's very convenient, it's safe. I felt safe. I think the Da Vinci system is a good system and I'm very happy that the hospital has that available to anybody that would like to have it. I had a real good experience. For me, deciding to come to Lakeland was really an easy choice. Um, first, it's being cared for by my friends and neighbors. Um, second is the quality of something I am, of course, very familiar with. Um, I trust the folks in the operating room, I trust the folks on the post-surgical unit, uh, and I absolutely have confidence in the skills and the ability of Dr. Stockton. So there was really only one choice for me, and that was to come to Lakeland. I'm Howard McLaughlin, and I'm a Lakeland Da Vinci Masterpiece. My name is Karen Freeling. I'm a Lakeland Da Vinci Masterpiece. My name is Rosario Espinosa, and I'm a Lakeland Da Vinci Masterpiece. I am delighted to be one of Lakeland's masterpieces.
right. Well, I, I would like to say thanks. I know there's at least one person in the audience who was in that video for working with our marketing team and thanking the marketing team for making such a nice, nice video about patient experiences. It's always, it always, uh, I feel it on the inside when I watch the video. So it's uh, very nice of you to volunteer in that manner. Um, the team. So I thought about our team and our great team and I wanted to introduce you to the team and I thought, well, what's the greatest team picture that I can go find? And I thought first about the 1980 U.S. men's hockey team. And so I went to the internet to go find a picture of this hockey team and I got about two and a half seconds into that task and I said, well, wait a minute, I've got a great hockey team photo already. And so this is my 10-year-old son's hockey team getting ready to go attack. I am a hockey dad, and I'm knee-deep. So if you need any hockey gear, these are our um, robotic surgeons, myself, Dr. Bard, Clancy, Durham, Proctor, Winslow, and Wood. You're going to be meeting them all, obviously, in just a few minutes. Uh, these are some of the uh, staff that work with, us, work with us in the operating room, really the unsung heroes uh, of our lives. Uh, each one of these people plays a critical role in your outcomes. And if not for their dedication and their skill, uh, your outcomes would not be as good. So we, we absolutely love these people. OK, so um, now we'll move to the actual, if you will, individual presentations. I'm, the, I'm Ben Stockton, the urologist, uh, one of the urologists here at Lakeland. I work with Dr. Cracklow and Dr. Terhune as the urology team. We do the bulk of our time is spent in prostate, kidney, and bladder surgery. OK, so. Um, for my portion of the presentation, I'm just going to be showing a relatively short video of actual surgery. So if you're the type of person who can't or doesn't wish to tolerate this sort of thing, uh, we're going to be watching videos from actually inside the body now, so uh, be forewarned. Okay, so this is an operation called a partial nephrectomy or partial removal of the kidney for tumor. This is the story of a, a 59-year-old woman who uh, was found, who showed up uh, in the emergency room with left-sided pain. And we ultimately found her to have an obstructing left-sided kidney stone. But what we found on the other side ended up being more important. What we found on the right side is a 2.8 centimeter kidney tumor. Uh, 2.8 centimeters is just greater than one inch. And so here's a picture of uh, what we found inside of her. So let me, um, let me step to the front just for a moment here and use my pointer. So what you see here, this is the very top of the left kidney here. This is the right kidney. This, white, this right here, this kind of C-shaped structure is the actual kidney. This is a little water cyst at the back of the kidney. This is nothing. But what we're super interested in is this thing right here. That is a kidney cancer that silences her. And, and this really, it, it's, it's interesting for this story, but it's also interesting in the whole world of cancer care because this is what we want as cancer surgeons. We want to find tumors before they start bothering you. If you've got a tumor that's bothering you, giving you symptoms, giving you trouble, giving you blood in your urine, sometimes with kidney tumors, if you have a kidney that's a tumor that's doing that for you, by and large, that's a bad time to be finding the cancer. We want to find it before that time. So this is an incidental kidney tumor, which is what we want to find. So I met with this woman and talked to her about her kidney tumor, and we elected to go excise the tumor and a bit of a rim of normal tissue around it. That's our goal, a partial kidney removal. And so we'll be watching some video of the actual uh, operation now. So here I am uh, driving the actual robotic hands. You can see, by and large, I have a left and a right hand. What you see, the, there's a, a suction instrument that's being operated right there by Susan. Susan's sort of my right-hand man in the operating room. And uh, so she's helping to make some retraction so that I can remove the tumor, which is in that piece of tissue up here at the top of the screen. So this is all tumor plus a rim of normal tissue around it. And here I am just using some scissors to actually cut into the kidney tissue itself uh, ultimately liberating the tumor. 
During the process of this, we will typically put a, a clamp onto the blood vessels of the kidney so it doesn't bleed too much. Invariably, there'll still be some blood, but, but much less than without the clamp, for example. So once I have cut underneath the tumor and removed the tumor, then I'll take this little stitching device and I'll actually sew up the bed of the tumor or the, the crater that remains uh, so that when we then remove the clamps, it doesn't bleed too much or it doesn't bleed at all is the goal, obviously. So. And so here I am using the robotic tools to do this. So you can see the advanced movements that I can make with the surgical robot that is, is very difficult, if not just frankly impossible to make uh, without the robot. And here I am uh, using some suture to bring that gap in the kidney back together. So I just suture it up like you might stitch together a little purse, for example. Yeah, all these sutures that you see here are all dissolvable. So here I am uh, done with the tumor, and uh, then Susan, my beautiful first assistant, will bring in this special Ziploc bag and we'll drop the thing in there, and then um, make a little incision. The incision to remove that thing will end up being about that big in her abdomen, whereas in the old world, if you had looked just five or 10 years ago to do this type of operation, you would get an incision in your side that would be about I don't know, in the range of 10 to 14 inches in length. And so it, in terms of in the size of incision in your admin, it really is a tremendous step forward. Okay, any questions about the video? That was actually uh, sped up a little bit. We, 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 we did that in order to make some time improvements for tonight, um, but not sped up too much. Actually, you know, I talked about putting the clamp onto the blood vessels of the kidney. Well, that means there's no blood flow going to the kidney, and that's a bad situation for the kidney. We don't like that. So once the clamp goes onto the kidney, we, I, am very conscious of how much time is elapsed because we don't want the clamp on there very long at all. So we do, in a sense, hustle up, get the kidney tumor excised, get the thing sewn up, and then get the clamp off. And so we do want to move expeditiously. Red jacket. Correct. Yep, she's doing it in what we call standard laparoscopy, which just sticks in the abdomen. Yep. Yeah, that's right. It's generally about a quarter to a half inch in size. So each incision for the trocars or for the little sleeves is about that long. Okay, so um, I'd like to go ahead and move ahead. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. And uh, I think our next speaker will be Roy Winslow from General Surgery. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Stockton. Appreciate the good presentation. We're very fortunate to have uh, somebody of Dr. Stockton's ability. I don't know if you've ever heard of a surgeon's surgeon, but what we mean by that is somebody that a surgeon would have do their operation, and that's what Dr. Stockton is to me and to many of us with his experience and ability. He's our leader, and we're fortunate to have him. If you need anything done on the organs he mentioned, bladder, or kidney, or prostate, there's no reason to leave town. You can get the best care right here. Um, my little flasher's red and green. Are they able to hear this, or should I be using this? It keeps going back and forth. I can do the robot, but I can't do the microphone, sorry. <laughs> Okay, good. So we really appreciate you coming out tonight. It was really exciting earlier this afternoon to meet with some of the students from robotic teams, some of the uh, teens, and even some elementary students that were here to try out the uh, demonstrator and to ask questions, really great questions. We have a great system of education in this community, don't we? And how exciting that we've got two area teams representing Michigan in the big competition for robotics. Have you heard that this week in the paper? I think we should be recognize those families and the kids and the coaches. Uh, working with them. Um, we want to tell you about what we see in general surgery, myself, uh, in general surgery with Southwestern Medical Clinic working here at Lakeland, and Dr. James Clancy, who's going to be sharing this presentation with me. Both of us are general surgeons 
who are newer to the use of the robotic device since last May of 2013, using it for several applications, several kinds of procedures. And I'm going to talk to you first uh, about the use for gallbladder surgery. You heard the testimonial of a lady who had that operation with a single incision. And I want to just tell you where I've come from as a surgeon with the different options for this. But first, since we're talking about schools, we need a quiz. Some of you watched Letterman, and you know they have the top 10. So I'm going to ask you the top three qualities. What are the top three qualities that a general surgeon should have? To be an ideal surgeon, what are the top three qualities you need? Any ideas? It's, from a, it's an old English proverb. You need knowledge. That's true, but that's not the top three. You need the eye of a what? The eye of an eagle. That's number one, to see well and see precisely and carefully. You need the heart of a lion to be courageous in the face of danger and uncertainty and to look out for your patient. And you need a third thing, the eye of an eagle, the heart of a lion, the hands of a woman. And that's what they taught us in surgery training way back when. You need the nimble and tender and slender and flexible and dexterous hands of an elegant woman. And so you can't quite see that in my hand, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> and some of, my, uh, some of my professors would remind me of that from time to time. But uh, that was for well, the three qualities. And you know, in surgery, for me, we learned everything when I came through through large incisions, as Dr. Stockton said, and then made a conversion to smaller incisions for the sake of patients, for rapid recovery, for, smaller, uh, for less pain. But you know, we lost something. We lost the ability to put our well-trained hands and our vision back inside the end. We were relying on television cameras and screens and instruments from the outside. I tell some people it's like changing a spark plug without opening the hood. You know, you drill some holes in the hood and have to go in there and change the spark plug. So what we want to tell you is some of the uh, advances that have happened with gallbladder surgery that's possible right here at Lakeland. And this shows you an example of some amazing instruments that go through those devices that Dr. Stockton's already reviewed nicely. And in the middle, you'll see a uh, lens which has two openings. Uh, those two openings give us stereo vision, three-dimensional. So this shows you an example, and then they see that hand to give us an instrument which allows us to flex and bend and do many of the things even better than our fingers could do inside someone's abdominal cavity. Well, as he said, this is not a robot operating on anybody. We call it minimally invasive surgery. That's the big catchphrase, using the smallest incisions, the least invasion to your body. The surgeon's in charge. The robot's not doing anything unless one of us tells it what to do. We operate all the controls, all the instruments are under our control, nothing's automatic, the robot's not working on you or doing things to you. We're using that device to help you recover better and have smaller incisions. You get an amazing view with three-dimensional stereoscopic view, and we lost that when we started working with laparoscopy. We had a television screen, but we didn't have depth perception. With this, we now can see depth again with three-dimensional view, just like a three-dimensional movie. You have a 10 times zoom to get up very close, right up next to very small structures and see them in incredible detail, which we couldn't do with standard laparoscopy. And then the ability to uh, adjust, you know, exactly how much motion uh, we see under the camera, but that's a little more technical. This gives you a little uh, demonstration or a image of the instruments inside of someone's abdomen. As we said, for the gallbladder surgery, it's called a single site. Instead of several cuts in the belly, Standard gallbladder surgery for most people is four separate cuts. Some of you in this room or your families probably have a large slash under the, under the rib cage. That's the way it always used to be done. Now we can make a single incision inside your navel, your belly button, less than an inch in size, put a little silicone ring in there, and you can see here a cross section. And I can just point at this uh, picture here. But you see that little device going through your muscle, and there's four different slender instruments going through that ring. Now on the outside, just like Dr. Stockton showed, these large arms do all the operating from outside as we control these very tiny, precise movements inside. Well, gallstone disease, just briefly, is very common. Everybody knows somebody has had a gallbladder problem. Women have it three times more commonly than men. It's the most common cause to end up in an emergency department or to be admitted to the hospital for abdominal pain. So it's a very frequent disease that we have to see as physicians and surgeons. The gallbladder, what's it do? Well, it has a function. It's a little storage tank, but that's about it. The liver does all the work, and the bile channel is a pipeline that carries the bile, and so you can live without it. It does serve a storage function to hold some extra bile to digest your food, but therein lies the problem, because when that bile sits there, it can do this. It can form little stones. 
And they can form little crystals. They can be the size of a grain of sand, all the way up to a golf ball. Or sometimes around Easter, we see Easter egg-sized <laughs> golf stones. Um, and so what's the options? Without getting into more detail, here's what I learned on the left. Open gallbladder removal, a large incision. We still use that occasionally when it's necessary, if it's a difficult case. But soon after I was trained, we looked down the hallway to some of our gynecologist friends, and they were doing amazing surgeries on ladies with little tiny band-aid incisions. And someone said, hey, why don't we do that for gallbladders? It took quite a while to get it adopted. It was very controversial. People weren't sure about it, sort of like you hear about with the robotic questions. But within a few years, most of us were learning to do it. And instead of being in the hospital for five days and off work for six weeks, which is what an open gallbladder surgery was, you went home the same day with four small Band-Aid cuts, and you're back to work in a week. Huge change. Revolutionized gallbladder surgery and abdominal surgery and other applications. And I don't have time tonight, but there was another variation a few years ago where we tried to do the single incision, but we were using the old instruments. And we're putting all these instruments jammed up in the abdomen, crossing over our arms, trying to make them work so that somebody could have a single scar, but we just didn't have the right tools. And that's what the big change is with the Da Vinci instrument that we now have. As you can see, a single incision in the navel. And this will just be a brief video to show you a demonstration of what it looks like. So if we look at somebody from the outside, And this is showing the overhead view with the, the robotic arms in place. As Dr. Stockton said, the surgeon himself or herself places these all through the small incision, gets them in place exactly where we want them. And then we move over to that console, and there's a secret. We get to take our gown and our gloves off and our shoes. We keep our scrub clothes on and sit very comfortably in a relaxed position as we operate these tools. And this just shows very briefly the view as you look from the inside. Uh, this is a view from the side. And they told me if I click this, it would start the video up. There we go. Now you're going to see a brief overhead view. And this is sort of like the camera looking right down through your belly button. You know, what we see inside, which is the intestines and the stomach and then the dark brown liver and the greenish gallbladder. And see, there's no blood in my slides, so you can continue to eat. <laughs> and of course, we operate with uh, very minimal bleeding as does Dr. Stock. And here we are putting little metal clips inside and then cutting between those clips. And we use a special device to free the gallbladder from the liver. And when we're all done, we pull that right out with the instruments, right out from the navel. So incision at the end is closed up inside your navel. That scar is completely inside that little dimple. And once it's healed, it's barely visible. Some people say scarless. It's just a barely perceptible scar. So what's the advantages? Very low rate of complications from this procedure. Very rare to have to convert to the big open incision with the precision and view that we have. Uh, as we said, virtually no scar. Very high patient satisfaction to have a single hidden scar rather than several. Very minimal pain. So if this is something that's of interest to you or your friends or family, you know, be ready. Know what your risk factors are. Meet with your physician. Uh, talk to your doctor about your options. Get a second opinion if you like. And then, as the lady said in the video, choose the option that's right for you. And uh, we're going to save questions for the end so we can get through the presentation. I'd like you to meet Dr. James Clancy, who will continue this part. Thank you, Roy. Um, as Dr. Winslow said, one of the most common procedures that we do as general surgeons is gallbladder surgery. The second most common procedure that we do is hernia surgery. And I'm going to talk a little bit about ventral and incisional hernias. Um, this is not the groin hernias or the inguinal hernias that are probably the, the, the most common procedure we do. But ventral hernias or incisional hernias also make up a major part of a general surgeon's uh, practice. The definition of a hernia is a hole in the abdominal wall musculature where there may be some protrusion of the abdominal contents or not. And the reason that we need to fix these is if this is your intestines that are stuck out, that can cause pain, but more importantly, that becomes entrapped in there and it can lead to a bowel obstruction or twisting of the bowel, which could be more of a life-threatening emergency. So when we see abdominal wall hernias as general surgeons, we're talking to the patients about it's important to fix them. Um, as this slide shows, 
it is a very common problem. There's over 300,000 ventral incisional hernias performed annually in the United States. Anytime somebody has an operation, if you take all comers of the abdomen, there is a 10% incidence of developing an incisional hernia through that. Patients that smoke, obese, diabetes, multiple prior surgeries, um, emergent surgeries, all these things add to that 10% rate. So this is a very, very common problem that uh, we spend a lot of resources on in the United States taking care of. Traditionally, we have two ways to repair these. We have open techniques and laparoscopic techniques. When we do an open technique, we make an incision directly over the hernia defect. We usually get into the abdominal cavity. We free up the entrapments find the defect in the fascia, and then we reinforce and bring the fascia together like happened at the first, first surgery that you had, but that didn't work the first time. So we went to school and we realized that we need a better way to do it the second time. So we usually implant mesh. When we do them laparoscopically, we don't make an incision over the where the defect is at. We make it out laterally, and we can go in there and free up all the scar tissue and pull the entrapped bowel or the fatty tissue out. But with the straight laparoscopic instruments, we have a lot of difficulty reapproximating the muscle in the midline. So we tend to put a mesh in and we bridge the gap with the mesh. It's hard to sew when you have the straight laparoscopic uh, instruments, so that makes it difficult to fixate the mesh. So we use tackers. And the patients tend to feel these tacks, so it tends to be a painful operation while the tacks are being absorbed. Sometimes we use permanent tacks, but a lot of times we use absorbable tacks. So with the advances with robotic surgery, I view that as sort of a hybrid procedure between the two. The benefits are we can make small incisions that are not over the defect, and then as I have a video that we'll show in a moment, we can reapproximate the muscle back and get that closed. That leads to less wound complications because we're not having a wound directly over the mesh. If we have a wound complication over the mesh and the mesh gets infected, that's a very bad problem. And since we get the muscle closed, we can put a nice large piece of mesh in there and get a lot of underlay. So we're going back to real surgery now, just for warning everybody. So in this part of the video, I'm using the cautery in my right hand and I'm pulling down the hernia sac. So this hernia is just above the patient's umbilicus. This is speeded up to shorten the, uh, the video time here. But we're reducing the, the contents. There's no bowel in this hernia. That was what's termed omentum or fatty tissue. And then here, after I cleaned it all out, I'm able to sew and reapproximate the muscle back in the midline. And that's what we're showing right here. And this would be very difficult, if, if not all impossible, to do laparoscopically because the instruments, the wristed instruments, it's basically like my hands being inside the, uh, the abdominal cavity. So there it shows that the muscle's been reapproximated. So if we just left it that way, then the hernia is going to come back. So now we're sewing a mesh in. So we use um, a couple permanent fixation sutures to hold the mesh up to the top. The mesh is made out of polypropylene in this product. That's a permanent mesh. And then I uh, put a suture all the way around that. We don't use the tacks. The tacks um, can be painful if you go through a nerve or some of the muscle belly. And there's the, uh, the end nice patch over that with a good four to five centimeters underlay in all directions. And that's all I have for for my portion of the talk. I believe Dr. Durham will be next. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jerry Durham. Actually, Samuel called me Jerry. But uh, the my presentation is on thoracic surgery. And I'm one of the cardiothoracic and vascular surgeons here. Um, if you look at robotic surgery, it actually was first developed for cardiac surgery, and it was first developed for mitral valve repairs. And so that you understand that this is technology that has been around for a while and has been developing for a while, that first surgery was 1993. 
However, it proved to be very difficult to apply the technology and the techniques at that time to heart surgery. And it went on to find urology and gynecology as the first specialties that fully embraced it and were able to use it in their procedures. Well, what is thoracic surgery? Thoracic surgery is one of the three specialties that I work in, and it's essentially working on the lung. And in this case, working on the lung to remove lung nodules or lung cancer. Here you see a lung nodule in the right middle lobe. This is a CT scan. The right side is where the arrow is. The nodule is there. It's 1.5 centimeters or about three-fifths of an inch. The left side is normal. And what you see again is that we do not know whether this is cancer or not. We only know that it's there and has a high probability of being cancer. And the only way that we know whether it's cancer is by either getting some tissue from it or removing it. This patient actually went on to have a wedge resection, taking that out, and it proved not to be cancer. When you look at thoracic surgery, how do we go on to choose the procedures for our patients? The original procedure was a thoracotomy. The second procedures that came along were like in general surgery and gynecology, laparoscopic or video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery, and then robotic surgery. The robotic advantages are visualization and precision of movement, but I underline that the old techniques, the open procedure, is the fail-safe procedure. If there are any complications or it can't be done any other way, the chest is opened and we look at it directly and use our hands. By the way, I have small hands, just so everybody knows. But we use an open procedure then to be able to use our hands and directly fill the tissue. Well, why change a proven method? Well, the answer to change an improving method is surgical trauma. If you have a lot of tissue damage as you operate, and specifically tissue damage as you get inside of the body, this causes pain. Pain is something which your body responds to adversely, and because of that, increases hospitalization, increases the length of time that you're here, and increases the length of time for recovery. So the other side of these new techniques is that they have to have the same results as the traditional methods. So we need the same long-term results with better short-term results, and that's what is being provided by these technologies. If you go to minimally invasive surgery, and we all talk about that, in cardiac surgery it's defined in two ways. One is not using the heart-lung machine or small incisions. In thoracic surgery it's using small incisions. The belief, again, is that the smaller the incisions without retraction of the chest cavity would cause less trauma, and therefore you have less pain. Well, the lung, the anatomy, this area is my passion, and the physiology in this area and the anatomy in this area is just wonderful. You have two lungs, right and left. You have five lobes. There's 52% of your function on the right side, 42% on the left side, as long as your lungs haven't been damaged in some other way by smoking or inhalational agents. And if I can say one thing that you take away from this talk, if any of you are smoking, stop smoking, because that's the number one problem in my area of specialty with coronary artery disease and lung cancer and emphysema. So five lobes. The gold standard for lung cancer is to take out one of these lobes. And the creation, there's a tremendous redundancy in the body. And you can have all of one lung removed, all of one side removed, and still live normally with daily activities, as long as the other side has completely normal function. If you look at the segmental anatomy of the lung, this is why we can take out lobes, because as that tree progresses for everything, the tree progresses for, this is from behind, the trachea, the tree progresses for the pulmonary veins, and the tree progresses for the pulmonary arteries. The reason in this situation alone, by the way, the arterial blood flow is dark because it's coming from the right heart going into the lungs to be oxygenated. 
in the, in the blood flow in the vein is red because it's been oxygenated, which is unlike any other color scheme you'll see for the rest of the body. And it has to do with the function of the lung is to oxygenate your blood, and the other function is to get rid of your CO2. The, the, so the segmental anatomy becomes important because, as you see, it branches out, and, and within each of these fissures, we can find that segmental anatomy. We can dissect it out. We can tie it off, or in this case, staple it off as we use a robot, and then be able to completely develop the fissures and take out the, uh, the lung of uh, question. If you, it, one of the techniques anesthesia has to use for us to do that is to create room within the chest cavity because you can imagine that your chest cavity is formed by your ribs, your mediastinum or the central portion of your um, uh, body, and by your diaphragm. And so we have to be able to create room. Well, how do we do this? Well, we put in a special endotracheal tube which has two balloons, one balloon there and one balloon here, and has two lumens one there and one down here. And with this technique, we're able to collapse one lung, one side, while we keep you alive by ventilating, oxygenating on the other side. And by doing that, we create room within the chest cavity that then allows us to get into, say, the right side with that lady with her right middle lobe, which would be here, and be able to then dissect out the blood vessels and uh, be able to remove the lobe. If, again, you look at and you come to see us, we talk about definitions, but a thoracotomy is a large incision. Fats is that thoracoscopic procedure. Lobectomy is removing the lung. And a wedge resection is what you saw Dr. Stockton doing when he was taking out just part of a partial nephrectomy of the, uh, of the uh, kidney. What is a regular, and, and, and this is to show you, again, to show you why there's surgical trauma. The routine incision is an incision that can be of any length, but it goes between the ribs and is of, uh, is of a considerable extent. You can begin to see what tissue destruction that causes. The other thing that then happens is to be able to have direct visualization, a chest retractor has to be put in, and then that gets opened up with sometimes broken ribs, and that also will cause long-term problems. If you look at the port placement for the robot then, the robot in, in chest surgery, the robot actually requires quite a few port placements, but they're five millimeters, which means they're about one-fifth of an inch in size. But you require several port placements to be able to put the instruments inside of the chest cavity. And then you use the instruments, and the nice thing about these instruments is, is that they're hinged right at their end point. If, you, if any of you are a machinist and you're working down inside of a cylinder or a square and your hinge point is hitting the edges of that cylinder or square, you can't use it fully. And so these instruments are hinged at their tip so that once we get them inside of the chest cavity, there's no interference from the chest cavity of using them. If you look at the percentages and how robotic surgery has developed. In 2000, first of all, I want to, uh, to underline the fact that 50% of the patients who show up with lung cancer, that cancer is already too advanced for any surgery. You then take the other 50% and you break that down, fully only 30% of all patients who show up with lung cancers are surgical candidates. We then take those patients and see that in 2009, only 1% 1 of the patients were um, uh, used with the da Vinci robotics. And you begin to see that that number has increased up to 10%. And that number will go higher. But the bottom line is, is that everybody who shows up with a lung nodule that we uh, are going to operate on, the first thing is, are they a surgical candidate? The second thing then is which procedure do we use to safely get this out of that patient? If you look, the plus of the da Vinci is a visualization, three-dimensional. You can magnify, you can bring it in close, and you can see exactly what you're doing. For me, the other plus is right hand in this. I get to keep my right hand and my left hand working as I've always used them in surgery. 
with the thoracoscopic approach, I often have to switch right hand and left hand. I'm not left-handed, so. And finally, is the precision of movement that you get from the uh, instrument. The precision, you, you, can, you can sit at that, count, uh, at that console and you can change how it responds. You can dial in like a computer how it responds to your movements. And you can change it from time to time if you want to. So in conclusion, this is an evolution of how we've been practicing thoracic surgery now since the 1940s. But the goal is to improve the short-term um, um, uh, uh, results for our patients. If we go to this, this just shows you what we do in our free time to practice. That's a great. And so you see the, the precision of these instruments of the person who's working away from the instruments. You see they're hinged at the tip of the, uh, of the uh, instrument. And there you see it's peeling back uh, the skin of the um, grape. Thank you. And I think Dr. Bard is next. Thank you, Dr. Durham. I'm John Bard. I'm one of the OBGYNs here who's been in practice for about 11 years here. I'm one of the members here of, who's been around since the inception of, of our robot here at Lakeland. So in 2007, when Dr. Stockton basically um, harbingered the uh, robot to come here, and Dr. Tierhune was was incredibly instrumental in that as well, I started to become more interested in, in how I could utilize the Da Vinci in my practice. Um, so in line with Lakeland's um, vision for minimally invasive healthcare systems overall, you know, I certainly thought that the Da Vinci uh, gynecologic program with its minimally invasive surgical systems certainly fit in line with that. So along with that, some of the members here as well as some other members in Lakeland um, uh, started to develop the gynecology uh, protocols, the privileges, uh, credentials, as well as the uh, training requirements for the physicians that were to be doing um, gynecology. And unlike Dr. Stockton, I didn't have any residency training in this, so I had this was all post residency training um, that I underwent. Um, the Da Vinci Intuitive program was very instrumental in that as well. So I went to training, and in January of 2008, I went ahead and um, let me go forward here. There we go. There we go. Um, so in, in uh, January, of, yeah, I know that was about an hour ago. They, they play that when a baby's born, but it's usually delayed because it's when the mom leaves the uh, OB unit to go to her postpartum floor. So anyways, um, so in January of 2008, <laughs> that's not the actual birth, um, I performed my first solo um, gynecologic procedure, which was a hysterectomy, removing the uterus, tubes, and ovaries in a woman, and she did fine. Uh, since then, uh, we've done about 97 procedures overall within the gynecologic surgical systems, including hysterectomies, adnexectomies, which are basically just removing some degree of tubes and ovaries, as well as the sacrocopopexies with the help of Dr. Stockton. Uh, Dr. Rachel Proctor um, has significantly contributed to our numbers since uh, she started uh, basically in June of last year. Um, that's when uh, Lakeland decided to upgrade our system to the a more versatile model, which Dr. Stockton alluded to as well. Um, to a, a higher model, which gives us a great advantage um, over the older model. And our latest um, addition is Dr. Ben Stockton. He's a Da Vinci trained surgeon, uh, and he'll be starting. Huh? Ben I'm sorry, Ben Wood. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was actually looking up here. Uh, sorry, but yeah, Dr. Ben Wood. I'm sorry. That's my fault. 
Um, let's see if this works. So um, hysterectomy, of the, of the procedures, the gynecological procedures we've done here at Lakeland, hysterectomy itself is the most common one. And of course, it fits in right in line that it is the most gynecologic surgical procedure in, in the United States, uh, with up to 430,000 done around the United States in 2010. Uh, the majority of the, the indications for hysterectomies, uh, the top are the fibroids, and Dr. Proctor will be talking more about that later, abnormal uterine bleeding, which has multiple sources and causes, but yet um, is a separate indication. Uh, pelvic organ prolapse, which is, you know, droppage of the pelvic organs, mainly the uterus. Uh, various types of pain causes, uh, the number one being endometriosis. And cancers at, um, are done in other institutions, and we're not doing that at this point. Uh, of the hysterectomies over the years, this from 2007 to 2010, um, we see that the numbers of, of true hysterectomies are going down. Um, now, now this slide depicts the, the indications for each one, but this really this is a, a good slide that represents the concept of the minimally invasive healthcare system, which really is ways of cutting down. Um, all kinds of health care that go to us as recipients, as, as patients, and that's including uh, blood work, x-rays, as well as surgical procedures. And then, of course, within the surgical procedures, uh, we want to cut that down into minimally invasive surgery, and that's kind of what we all do here. Um, so the surgical approaches, when it comes down to just removal of the uterus and um, the tubes and ovaries are um, the number one approach had been in the old-fashioned approach, which is we still do today, and it still has indications today, is the abdominal approach. We usually make an incision like four to five inches and sometimes longer, depending on what kind of pathology we see on the inside. The vaginal approach is another minimally invasive approach and is a gold standard to performing. That's where the entire specimen comes through the vagina. A conventional laparoscope, uh, we typically call it uh, straight stick laparoscopy, and that's where all the instruments don't have any kind of bending and, and accessory movements from the outside. And then, of course, the robotic techniques, uh, which we're here to talk about more. Um, and this slide depicts um, just within the, that time frame, the 2007-2010 time frame, um, just how much uh, we've come when it comes down to improving, or even over that time frame, how much robotics itself has improved the, the amount of minimally invasive uh, procedures. So we, as we see through the, uh, again, I'm not sure if this, oops, sorry. Um, we see how this declines here over those three years uh, as far as the abdominal approach is actually going down in numbers. And then we see how much this robotic approach is going up. And this is this curve is so much greater than this, but that also takes from these um, categories as well. And so I'll turn turn the mic over to Dr. Ben Wood um, to discuss further details about how hysterectomies go with the Da Vinci system. Good evening. So Dr. Bard talked about we have different approaches to do hysterectomies. Um, and I'll go through each of these different approaches, the benefits and the kind of restrictions that we have while doing the approaches and why we are moving towards robotic surgery. When we do a hysterectomy, the patient has a choice of either, either having a total hysterectomy or a partial hysterectomy. And when we say partial hysterectomy, we mean that we leave the cervix behind and we take the body of the uterus. When we do a total hysterectomy, we take the whole body of the uterus and the cervix. Commonly, when we do hysterectomies, we also do surgery, as Dr. Bard said, on the adnexa, and that includes the tubes and the ovaries, and we commonly will take those at the same time. These diagrams show typical incisions for hysterectomies. Um, with the abdominal hysterectomy, we either do a transverse low incision um, that is typically about 14 centimeters in length, or we do a vertical incision that goes from the belly button to the pubic bone. 
And again, that depends on the size of the uterus and the indication for surgery. The laparoscopic hysterectomy typically has three incisions, and it's the one at the belly button, and both sides bilaterally, two small incisions lower on the abdomen. The robotic surgery, we typically right now do not do the single site incision, um, but that is something that we'll be working towards most likely in gynecology. The incisions are typically at the belly button. That's where the camera goes. Again, bilateral lower. And then this is the assist, assistant port. Vaginally, the incision is at the top of the vagina. The indications for abdominal hysterectomy typically are a large uterus or if there are a lot of scar tissue around the uterus. Um, the incisions, as I said, for abdominal hysterectomy are typically low on the abdomen or a vertical midline incision between the belly button and the pubic bone. And this diagram is to show all the different layers that we have to make the incision through to perform that surgery and why it is more painful after an abdominal hysterectomy because with the vertical, we have to cut through all of these layers and then spread the muscles to the side. With the low incision, we have to make the incision across right here, and then we have to spread the muscles to the side, and that is more painful. With the larger incisions comes issues with more blood loss, longer recovery, um, and the possibility of higher risk of complication. Vaginal hysterectomy, as Dr. Bard said, is the gold standard, but it's not the most common procedure that we perform. Abdominal hysterectomy by numbers is the most common, but we're trying to get away from that and do more minimally invasive surgery. So the issues with the vaginal hysterectomy are visualization. We are, our surgical site is looking through the vagina, so our field of view is about two to three inches wide. And we have to do a lot of that surgery by feel. And so we feel the tissues and we feel up the side of the uterus and we have to make our dissection that way. Then came the advancement of laparoscopy. This allowed us to do essentially the same surgery, but now we could see the top part of our uterus with a camera. And we are able to do that, as you've heard on multiple occasions tonight, with straight sticks. Um, and then with the laparoscopy, we are able to do either a total hysterectomy and make an incision and remove the uterus through the vagina, or we can do a partial hysterectomy and remove the uterus through one of our small incisions. The issues with Laparoscopy, as you've heard already tonight, are the straight sticks make it so that we don't have as much dexterity. Um, they really are just straight instruments and you move the instruments with your arms. Um, also, our visualization is two-dimensional on a TV screen. And the camera, uh, one thing that hasn't been mentioned, you're relying on the assistant holding the camera for you. Um, or yourself holding the camera. So you're trying to hold the camera with one hand, do the surgery with the other, or you're having your assistant hold the camera and do the surgery. With the robot, the camera stays very stable and the, the field of view remains stable. So this is our normal sized and normal shaped uterus. Um, we have our ovaries and fallopian tubes here. This is a very simple diagram that doesn't show all the connections of the uterus, but we have connections that go all the way down the side of the uterus that have to be dissected. And you can see with a vaginal hysterectomy, you have to make your incision around the cervix, and then you have to dissect up all the way to the top of the uterus. Um, with the laparoscopic and the robotic surgeries, we're able to do the dissection down to the cervix and we're able to see the whole time. What you see here are the robotic instruments. 
and they're going to come in and you can see that they have you can rotate and manipulate the wrists that you can't do with a straight laparoscopy so you start with dissection at the top you remove the ovaries and fallopian tubes and then you dissect down around the vagina which is what they're doing here and then you'll see them remove the uterus and we remove the uterus through the vagina and then you suture the top of the vagina closed and that is the robotic procedure and this just shows the incisions that would be made for the robotic procedure and then next Dr. Proctor will come up and she will talk about uterine fibroids and endometriosis thank you good evening I'm Rachel Proctor. I practice at South Shore Women's Healthcare with Dr. Kutzner, Dr. Jung, Dr. Grabmeyer. I'm tasked to talk to you all about fibroids tonight. Dr. Bard already established that they're the most common reason that U.S. women undergo a hysterectomy. The reason for that is because they're extremely common. If you're a woman in this room and you have a uterus, you most likely have a fibroid. Uh, as many as 80% of women have them. You may not know it though because fortunately most of them do not cause symptoms, they're not cancerous, most women never have to have their fibroids treated. But about one in five women of reproductive age have a symptomatic uterine fibroid. Uh, what are fibroids? They're muscular tumors, they grow in the wall of the uterus. We established they're almost always benign or non-cancerous. They can be as small as an apple seed or as big as a cantaloupe or a grapefruit. I've taken out some fibroids that are as big as babies. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's the bulky size of these fibroids that can really be a challenge uh, to surgeons, especially when we start thinking about um, operating through small incisions to remove these fibroids. Um, let's go forward here. Um, fibroids can cause heavy bleeding and painful periods. They cause a feeling of fullness sensation in the lower abdomen or stomach. Uh, the most common reason that women seek medical treatment is the bulk symptoms. They start to feel that there's sensation of, of feeling pregnant when they know that they're not, or feeling pressure in the pelvis. Um, they may have pain during intercourse, low back pain. Um, fibroids can also cause complications during pregnancy and childbirth or reproductive problems such as infertility. So th these are reasons that might lead us to want to treat or remove the fibroids. So how do we treat fibroids? Well. We can treat them with medications. Medications don't treat the fibroids, but they help manage and control the symptoms of the fibroids. So for young women who wish to maintain fertility, we'll sometimes use medications to try to buy some time before we have to remove the fibroids. Um, but for the focus of today's talk, we'll talk about surgical options for treatment of fibroids, either hysterectomy, removal of the entire uterus, including the fibroid, or myomectomy, removal of just the fibroid, and preservation of the healthy uterine tissue. Both of these are possible with the da Vinci. Okay. So myomectomy, why might a woman choose to have a myomectomy instead of a hysterectomy? Most, most women when they're diagnosed with fibroids are in their late 30s and 40s and they've completed childbearing. Most women choose to have a hysterectomy. When you have one fibroid, you often have many. So, um, and they tend to recur. So for most women, because the recovery is, sim is similar for both myomectomy and hysterectomy, they choose to have the uterus removed. But especially for a young woman who hasn't completed childbearing, myomectomy is a, is a viable option, removal of just the, just the fibroid. And um, da Vinci helps make this possible um, by giving us some of these extra tools uh, to negotiate around these large bulky fibroids uh, through small incisions. So I'll talk briefly about surgical options. The same principles apply for hysterectomy as for myomectomy. We can do open surgery through a large cutter incision. The advantage of that is we can get our hands in there, we can feel, we can touch the fibroids, we can move them around, uh, we can take the large fibroids out the incision. Um, um, you know, what leads a surgeon to choose one option over another? In general, the surgeon's going to choose the procedure that maximizes the patient, patient's safety best achieves the goal of the operation, but yet when we can do it in a minimally invasive fashion, that's going to improve, improve patient recovery and outcomes. 
Um, traditional laparoscopy um, is minimally invasive, but it has, especially in the situation of fibroids, has the challenges of operating in a narrow field with a straight instrument around um, an irregular, bulky object. The Da Vinci helps overcome some of these challenges by giving us wristed instruments uh, that can move around um, in this field and also the um, improved visualization, being able to see the small detail. So I've already covered that. <laughs> Um, really what the da Vinci does for us is it translates an open surgical technique into small incisions. So we're able to do with our hands what we would do when we were in an open incision, but, but through these small incisions. So it's really, it, it helps us translate this open surgical technique. And um, it gives us a minimally invasive approach to remove these heavier or more numerous, bulky, difficult fibroids that traditionally surgeons are going to... Uh, lean more towards recommending open surgery before we had these tools. I'll talk a little bit about that more at the end, but first I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about endometriosis. Endometriosis is, a, is another field or another area in gynecology extremely common um, where da Vinci really has the potential to revolutionize uh, surgery for women with endometriosis and give them more options for minimally invasive surgery. Endometriosis is when endometrial tissue, that's tissue inside the uterus, grows in areas outside the uterus. And you can see the picture comparing normal to severe endometriosis. It coats the surfaces of the uterus and the tubes and the ovaries and the bladder and the intestines, and they stick together and form adhesions. Women often live with pain and suffering for years before they discover that they have endometriosis. The hormones that stimulate this tissue inside the uterus to cause it to swell and bleed every month um, cause the same stimulation of this tissue when it's in other areas of the body. So they go through a cycle of recurring pain and swelling and then the resultant scar tissue that occurs. So it can lead to ovarian cysts, endometriosis within the ovary, chronic pelvic pain, difficulty getting pregnant, and can potentially cause problems with the bladder and intestines as well. Um, these uh, hysterectomy is an option for women who have endometriosis. Sometimes hysterectomy can be challenging for women who have endometriosis because the anatomy is distorted, there's scar tissue, and it doesn't allow us to remove the uterus through the gold standard gynecologic minimally invasive surgery, the vaginal hysterectomy. We can't get around those adhesions. So this gives us a way to approach hysterectomy for a woman with endometriosis without having to resort to the old-fashioned open big incision. There's some exciting technology on the horizon as well that I'll just very briefly mention uh, called Firefly, which is allows, allows us to use fluorescence imaging to better visualize the endometriosis. So that's on the horizon and uh, really has some potential to revolutionize uh, gynecologic surgery uh, using the da Vinci. Um, my very last slide, I thought it was my last slide. <laughs> okay, so what I'd like to close with is I came on board with the robotics program in 2013. Actually, I dabbled in it a little bit in 2007 when we first got the robot, but I wasn't really at a phase in my career where I wanted to focus on that, and it was sort of in its infancy still in gynecology, but with the acquisition of our newer, fancier, exciting tools, decided to take another look at robotic surgery and came on board with the program um, in June when we acquired the new robot. And I just want to show, these stats are not actually Lakeland stats in general. This is for my private practice. And I want to show how just one year of adding the Da Vinci to the program has been able to change these stats. Um, Dr. Bard showed a slide earlier in the program that talked about the approach to hysterectomy. And nationwide, 65% of hysterectomies are done abdominally. Um, you can see that here, this is um, myself and my three partners at South Shore. We're already in 2012, only doing 27% of cases abdominally. So we've been, prior to the robot, pioneering minimally invasive surgery through vaginal route, through laparoscopic route. And now we have this additional tool for the properly selected patient that we can bring that abdominal hysterectomy number down even lower. And in 2013, uh, amongst our four physicians, with only one of us doing robotic surgery, we had only 9% um, abdominal hysterectomy. So, 
excited to see what the future holds as more of my colleagues' interest is peaked as well in uh, robotic surgery. And I'm not sure who is next. Yeah. Is that you? <laughs> Um, I just want to take a, a few minutes and think about the future and what can be uh, for us. Um, I've written down four topics I just wanted to review and we discuss on the horizon. I don't have any pictures or slides, but just a couple of thoughts. Uh, simulation. How do we get better at surgery? How do we get better at surgery without practicing on you? Uh, we already have simulators in the world of uh, robotic surgery. and In fact, we have a simulator set up here. And so it's important for our resident surgeons, the trainee surgeons, to learn how to operate without touching you. And it's important for us as well. So simulation is an important part of our life and will actually grow in importance as we move forward. Number two, automation. So we do the operation and I take out a prostate and prostates are different, but they also are all a lot alike. Can the robot, can the computer help me to see and help me to understand better what I'm seeing? Can the computer software help me know what decisions to make? In today's world, the answer is a little bit no. But in the future, as we march forward, we may be finding that the computer gives us suggestions about what to do as a surgeon, actually as we're sitting there doing your operation in the future. Take a deep breath. The next topic I'd like to discuss is what we call NOTES, or Natural Orifice Transluminal Endoscopic Surgery. NOTES, it's a word we all know. It asks the question, can I take out your kidney by taking a very fancy, somewhat bulky, somewhat flexible camera and passing it down your mouth, down your throat, through your stomach, into your abdomen, go find that kidney, dissect the kidney safely, and then put the kidney into a bag and take it out exactly the path from which I came. Or you can do that through the vagina as well. These operations have already been done in pig laboratories. They've been done in people as well. But the technology is not ready for prime time, as we say, quite yet. So that will be something that will be an exciting development. So that really will be truly scarless surgery. We talked about just having a little scar at your belly button. Well, maybe you could just have the scar inside your vagina where it would never be seen. And then finally, um, surgery or therapy that is entirely performed outside the body. And we do this in the world of medicine today as it is. For example, I'll break kidney stones in you without entering your body at all. We'll treat cancers by sending radiation through your body. And we will be pushing the boundary of how do we treat you without violating you at all. And so these are some of the things that we'll be looking for in the future, hopefully during my practice lifetime. Okay, with that said, I think that's all we have. Uh, and so now we can open it up for questions, please. Yes, so the question is, where is the anesthetist and what is his role during all this? Is that a fair statement? So the anesthetist is present in the room and playing largely the same role for you that he would play otherwise. He's responsible for putting you to sleep. He's responsible for standing next to you during the operation and monitoring your heart and lungs and your oxygen levels and taking care of you while we do our work. And so uh, he'll be at the head of the bed with keeping an eye on this tube that may be in your mouth down into your trachea. So the anesthesiologist role, there are some things that are different about it, but it is a lot the same as in the old world. I, I, I'm not going to profess to have enough knowledge of that to make any meaningful statements. But do I know what do I know what anesthetic agents were used? It was a question, and I dodged it. Okay. I was uh, as I was looking at the the actual surgical procedures with real go uh, organs, it appeared as if the organs were uh, surrounded by a space, uh, an airspace, if you will, or something. I know, for example, in a colonoscopy air is pumped in to allow the instrument to move around. Is that similar, or is there a similar technique when you're doing robotic surgery? The, the short answer is yes, absolutely. So when we, when I operate on your kidney, I'll actually blow your belly up with carbon dioxide. And then we do the operation in that 
Astrodome of space, if you will. So I'm from Houston, so it's always the for me it's always the Astrodome. So once you are uh, in, uh, you got the instruments inside the body. How often do you have to pull out to change uh, instruments? Frequently. Okay. Yep, we change instruments a lot. Um, uh, we just have lots of different tasks to do, and you may find you reach better by one technique or from the left or from the right, and so frequently is the sh very short answer to that. But the robot's never undocked. Uh, correct. The, the, we, we leave the robot attached to your body. The question was, or, or Ben was nice enough to make the statement, the robot's not undocked. That's correct. The instruments slide in and out of your body, in and out of the robotic system, rather quickly, rather seamlessly, and so we can make those sort of changes to our logistics without too much effort. So the advantages are improved visualization, uh, more robotic safety checks, uh, and better movement. And so those are, and, and smaller instrumentation, smaller instrumentation as it pertains to the robot as it mounts onto your body, so it it facilitates the entire operation. On the operation of how fast you move the uh, the fingers and the cutters and so forth, your your video was speeded up. The one on the grape was that about the speed? I didn't pay enough attention to the great video, so it, it great. The great video was real life. Yeah, so <laughs> that was real, real, real life. Speed. Real, real time. Yeah, real. we don't actually operate on grapes, but uh. <laughs> no, I was curious. We have one in the back of the room. Please, yes. Why are you restricting it to non-cancerous pelvic surgeries at this point here when it's being done in Kalamazoo? Okay. I can answer. Yeah. Um, here, it's turn it on. Basically, because we do not have any gynecologic oncologists here on staff here. So we feel that that surgery is best. And of course, the majority of our gynecologic oncologic cases are done around the country extensively. It's, it's, it's a bigger field than the, than the benign part, not with numbers, but as far as per, per providers, as far as oncologists around the country. But we just don't want to have one on staff here at this point, so we were we were for those out, those that could do the surgery, even with the Da Vinci approach. Um, you know, because we feel that's what's best for the patient. Thank you. How do you determine, uh, or how do you safeguard that something doesn't happen while you're in the middle of surgery somewhere? Well, I, it's a it's a complex answer, uh, but uh, the Intuitive Surgical has been working on this project for decades, essentially, to build the software and hardware so that it is reliable. We we're asking about reliability. It is an important uh, comment that if you come for your robotic operation, we think the the chance of there being some robotic problem, some logistical or mechanical problem with the robot, is not zero, and so I we'll often talk to patients about just that fact that if we have a significant robotic problem, we might have to convert to the old standard cut you open type of operation or discarding the robot and using just the old fashioned straight camera inside of you. But in reality, I, I think I've had not had one of those sort of instances since I've been here. I think it's zero. There have been times we've had um, I don't like to use the word glitches, but we've had the robot behave in a manner that we didn't understand, and you can see it. I mean, you're watching the entire operation, and always uh, we have the ability to actually call intuitive engineers from the operating room and say, this is what we're experiencing, and then they can help us through those problems. Never have I been in a situation, however, that I thought was dangerous to the patient. If we ever enter that realm, we stop. We, we discard the robot and we say we're going to fall back on what our old, what our training tells us to do. So, yes. The Da Vinci robot is made by one company. That's Intuitive Surgical, uh, based in is it Sunnyvale? Is that right? Is, is Brian still here? Anyway, so based in Sunnyvale, 
California, which is just south of San Francisco. And essentially, if you really, if you want to coarsely answer the question, it is the only robotic system out there in today's world. There's been lots of startups over the years which have threatened them in some regard, but by and large, it's this one platform in today's world. But it will change, it will evolve, and it has evolved. Yes? I'm curious about the time factor. Does the robotic surgery take about the same amount of time as the standard, the, the old procedure? Well, I'm going to, uh, I'll answer for myself. And the short answer is, uh, it, no, it does not take about the same amount of time. By and large, it takes longer. We have probably the most data for prostate removal. And when I was in the very dawn of my urology training, we did a lot of prostatectomies by the open technique. And basically, it's sort of a two to two and a half hour operation. If I take out your prostate now and things are good and things are smooth, it's sort of three to four hours. And so, and, and now that's me personally too. I'm, I'm sort of a slow and steady wins the race kind of guy. Um, but it does take longer. I don't know if you all have the same feelings. Well, for instance, with gallbladder surgery, it's uh, approaching the same time. I think we talk about something called a learning curve in surgery with a new device and new instruments, and we're taking our time to do it carefully and smoothly. So as we've done many of these since May, when our operating times are getting shorter and shorter, so they're now coming very close to the time of a, of a standard laparoscopic cholecystectomy, perhaps in the range of 10 to 15 minutes longer. I would agree. Gynecologic surgery takes about the same amount of time to do it as it does to do traditional laparoscopic surgery. It's significantly shorter to do open surgery. But for other, compared to other minimally invasive techniques, it's about the same time. The amount of time that it takes to get the robot into position adds a, additional time to the surgery. So actually sitting down at the council and doing the surgery is about the same amount of time, but you do have the additional time added on for putting the robot into the correct location, taking the time to make sure that the robotic arms are not going to hit each other, um, and then undocking the robot and closing the incision. All right, wonderful. Yes, please. I was just curious how many people here tonight so um, the answer is quite a few, I think. So it, 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 you know, we 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 try in today's world not to talk too much about our health problems in public settings, or at least we're trained not to ask about health problems in public settings. So, uh, but some uh, certainly is the answer. All right. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Oh, please. You had a question? Of the new Da Vinci versus the old one, the one that you bought in 2013? So uh, smaller instrumentation, which allows for better, better uh, geometry at the patient, if you will, better vision, and better safety, more safety checks uh, from inside the robot. So. The ability to do what we call single site surgery, where we make an incision through the belly button and jam all the instruments through the belly button, or place all the instruments through the belly button, pardon me, uh, really does, uh, is really a, a dramatic step forward. And so that, that has changed uh, our world a lot. And one thing in gynecological surgery, um, with the old robot, the first generation, the robot had to be, for, for a hysterectomy, it had to be docked between the legs. And we have to move the uterus around, and that means somebody has to be between the legs or at least holding the uterus. And the, when they're talking about smaller instrumentation, they're talking about the council, the whole robot itself. So we can now dock the robot to the side of the patient, opening up space for the assistant to have better access to the patient during surgery. <laughs>